So we're going to uh, we're going to start with a with a chat, um, and I'm delighted to welcome that lady who's been waiting patiently on there on video um, uh, uh, for a few minutes now. Um, it's it's an it's an honour to to have you with us, Lisa. Lisa Carnahan um, is uh, serving as the associate director for IT standardisation in the Information Technology Laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, many of you will have heard of NIST. Lisa is responsible for developing laboratory programmatic strategies for standards engagement and conformity assessment approaches, understanding potential standards opportunities in emerging technologies, and promoting the benefits of conformity assessment and standards adoption and use in the federal government and industry. Lisa currently serves as the NIST lead on the conformity assessment aspects of the NIST cybersecurity framework and privacy framework efforts. So, a lot of things that are of uh, very, very similar, a lot of synergy with, between uh, um, NIST and the Open Group. We, uh, we, we believe in standards, we believe in, um, in certification and, and conformity assessments and uh, just the value of this. So a little more about Lisa. Lisa consults to the directors of the US HHS Health Information Technology Certification Program and the US HHS National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory, both very, um, very much in our in our minds at the moment. And Lisa is the convener of the U.S. Interagency International Cybersecurity Standardization Working Group. Um, and just to embarrass you one little bit further, Lisa, um, uh, it, I, I, I do want to share that Lisa was last month, in fact, awarded uh, a Leadership in IT Standards for Industry Award from the Washington Academy of Scientists uh, of, of Sciences. Sorry, um, which is a great honour. And uh, and anyway, we are delighted to have you here, Lisa. Welcome to the Open Group. And uh, if we were on stage, there'd be a big round of applause for you right now. But just imagine one. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Now, <laughs> thank you so much for having me, Stephen. Um, I was looking at this agenda, um, and it, and and I'm actually jazzed that the agenda is discussing standards on on how we can move forward in our new normal and how we work, what we do, where we work. So I. I I applaud the open group for, for the agenda you put together. It's very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've told our attendees today a little bit about, uh, a little bit about you and um, uh, you're, you're with NIST, um, very well known organization, certainly inside the United States. But uh, as you heard me say earlier, we have a lot of, a lot of folks from outside the United States. Could you just say a little bit about uh, what NIST is in the standards world and, and how it relates to to other standards uh, efforts? Sure, sure. So the National Institute of Standards and Technology um, is an agency in the US federal government. Um, we're non-regulatory. So our focus is on standards metrology and measurement. Um, we're the National Metrology Institute for the United States. So um, having said that, with, with just a few exceptions, we actually don't develop documentary standards, which are the type of standards we talk about here. Um, we actually think those standards are best developed in the private sector. So we see collaboration and participate with uh, SDO, Standards Development Organizations, um, like Open Group, um, and, and like many of, of you as participants, um, seek out those participations in SDOs. Um, and we rely on private sector developed standards like, like you all do as well. So um, our relationship to standards development and documentary standards development is that we do research primarily, we're a research institute, and we bring those results to SDOs as contributions, um, primarily focused on things like functional correctness, performance, test cases, how to measure the standards, things like that. So we are much like you um, as, as participants here today, um, as we are participants in SDOs, we are members of those. Um, we participate um, mostly in most of the relevant SDOs at a given time. Um, we're in ISO IC right now, we're in IEEE, um, we're in W3C and 3GPP and, and all the 5G, um, the IETF, OASIS, and, and yes, the open group. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, we're glad to have you um, uh, uh, active in our security forum. So um, yeah. thank you for that. So um, potentially a big uh, a big scope for for NIST. What are what are some of the key undertakings that NIST has on at the moment? The, the focus areas. Um, so I'll mention three. Um, I 
I come out of, you mentioned the information technology lab. So we have other laboratories for physics and chemistry and materials and things like that, but we'll focus on IT here. Um, and I'll mention a couple areas. We have a very large, um, a large research program and actually a coordinating function in the US government in the year of um, artificial intelligence. And we're looking at it um, from the perspective of what makes artificial intelligence trustworthy, right? How can we trust this, this, this new, um, um, these new tools that we'll, be, we'll have available? And so we're looking at the attributes that make AI trustworthy, the attributes everybody talks about, and we're looking at how to measure them. Another area we're looking at is the cybersecurity of um, IoT, information um, IoT devices. Um, and we're looking at from the perspective of addressing cybersecurity um, functionality and attributes in the design of the device itself, and then looking at how that functionality gets used through a product interface. Um, right, so we're down at the device and then it comes out into the, into the product interface. And then the third area certainly is zero trust that we're here talking about today. Okay, great. Great. So yes, zero trust we're talking about today. So what do you think makes that so so relevant today? So um, so the concept of, of zero trust, um, it, it, so zero trust, we, we kind of characterize it as a strategy. Um, and it's about moving defenses from these static network perimeters that we're so used to and getting out to dynamic risk-based access control to enterprise resources where they are, right, regardless of where they are. Um, and so it's really looking at implementing fine grain access control policies. That phrase, fine grained access control policy, has been around a very, very long time. We just never really implemented it because we, we relied so much on perimeter security. In the old days, when I started at NIST, we talked about computer security of a server. And then we started networking a few, and then the internet came, and we have this perimeter concept that if you're in the perimeter, you're trusted. If you're out of the perimeter, you're not trusted. Um, someone can get in the perimeter and wreak havoc. Um, and, and so now we have this zero trust concept, which focuses access control at the resource. And it has to be that way, because we are now working. We're, we're accessing resources all over the place. The resources are everywhere. We're everywhere. We're using all kinds of different devices. So that perimeter concept isn't going to hold up um, as, as we, um, as we um, start implementing these different types of architectures. I think that's why your, your conference here is so relevant in talking about these concepts. So um, I think that's why it's relevant. It, it, it allows cybersecurity and managing risk to to go out to where those resources and and where um, users are. Right. Yeah. No. Thank you. I, I we, we've all been through these different approaches to security over the years, and um, I know uh, in here at the Open Group, we we had a group that did some great work over over many years called the Jericho Forum, which was um, all about deperimeterization. One day I'll be able to say that first off, but. Um, uh, but that yes, th this this is this is new and different. So, so what are NIST are doing? What are NIST doing in zero trust? Sure. So, so we have a a, a, a zero trust in, um, program going on at NIST right now. Um, we have um, uh, some some documents that we published, and then and then some research components of them. So, just in August of this year, August 2020, we published a document on zero trust architecture. Um, it's NIST SP 800-207, if you want to write that down, SP 800-207. Um, it was actually done in collaboration with our CIO council. So in the U.S. government, every agency has a, a chief information officer. They come together in a group. Um, and it did two things. It, it, it laid out um, some of the concepts of zero trust. So this is new to a lot of people. And so it has an education awareness component. And then the other part is, is um, talking about considerations of applying zero trust concepts in federal enterprise environments, right? We're not talking about ripping and replacing new technology, but it's an evolution, right? right. Everyone has already their fielded systems. They have to evolve them. Um, and so it looks at, at, at uses and applications. It looks at assets and resources and subjects. And that's how it gets down into that fine grained access control, which is some, in some ways a replacement for, for the strong perimeter. Um, approach that we use now. Um, what we have in the works, um, we're looking actually at all of our security guidance portfolio. It's, it's pretty vast. And we're looking at how to update it based on some of these zero trust principles. Um, we have a new project called Telework Anytime, Anywhere. Um, 
very timely for now, right? Um, and we're looking to update that guidance based on standards that come out um, and, and, and guidelines that might come out and then the evolution of the technology. Um, I think we all learned, um, certainly NIST learned lessons when in March we all went to full-time telecommute. The first lesson we learned was our VPN wasn't big enough. Our pipe wasn't big enough, right? Um, luckily, our, 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 um, our operations folks were able to fix that right away. One of the other issues I, we noticed is that we started having to use do digitally signed documents in telework environments. Well, we always did that in the office, on the one machine, it was in the infrastructure. Was like, then we had to just push all that out onto our laptops, onto our phones, right? Very different. Um, and you have to think about that a little different. So that's what some of this telework anytime, anywhere effort is going to try to address. Um, so we'll be updating another document. We have a guide to telework remote access and bring your own device. Um, that's the title of it. And that might be the first document that, um, that we focus on because that's really looking at safeguarding the technology used for telework and remote, and remote work. So we're going to incorporate all the zero trust principles down into those documents. Right. No, it's great. As, as you say, very timely and uh, a lot of organizations are, uh, are struggling with those same same issues. Yeah. Um, so do you work with, I mean, uh, I'll say up front, uh, and I said before, we're, we're proud to have you in our security forum working with us. Do you, do you work with other um, standards organizations in the zero trust space? Um, so we work with we, we work with a lot of SDOs. Um, in, so the SDOs we work with in the networking space, so the IETF, not necessarily, I don't know that they call their work zero trust work, right? But this is right. a standards, a layered approach of standards and standards and standards. So um, so we do an awful lot of work in the IETF, in the cybersecurity space, um, in, in having some of those grounded networking standards available um, for implementing the zero trust. Um, and then we've joined Open Group and, and we're tracking the Open Group ZTA project um, you all provided us great feedback on our um, that that SPI special publication I talked about our zero trust architecture document. So thank you for that. Um, I know we're having discussions with you all in areas of collaboration. We we are fundamentally research institute and and push our research into into standards organizations of which you are. But you also have um, a lot of um, a sort of a, a, a little bit of a research component. You're not purely a standards organization. We view you as doing more than that. So I think there's areas we can collaborate. Um, and then we, we're, we're um, reviewing your zero trust principles document that, that you just pushed out for review. So congratulations on that. Um, and, and we'll certainly provide feedback on that document. That's great. That's great. So we've you've sort of set the context for for why it's why it's important why zero trust is important. Where where do you see it going, Lisa? Um, the direction it goes in and and the and the role of sort of standards in that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, where we see it going is probably where everybody else sees it going. We're not we're not unique. We don't have any great you know insight there. Um, but we think to for it to get where it's going to go, right? As we do day, digital transformation and 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 push out zero trust out to resource, um, we need we need to define principles and tenants and concepts and standards, right? And we think we can contribute to that certainly. Um, one of the one of our efforts, um, hopefully, to do that um, is a, a a collaborative effort we're going to have for in industry. We just announced it a few days ago. Um, I put the link on the chat. I don't know if I hit the right chat um, to put the link for our effort where you can find information about this. So we're we're starting a demonstration project where it's going to be in collaboration with industry. So industry companies that have products that can help build out uh, zero trust solutions can come and work with NIST, and we build um, one or more um, one or more solution sets of products come bringing products together. This is done at the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, NCCOE, which is a, a NIST effort. It's always in collaboration with industry. Um, and, and then there we do three, three things. We apply standards to the solution, right? That's first and foremost, we're NIST, we want standards. So we apply standards to solution, that's a requirement. And then hopefully out of it, we get good or best practices. I, I had best practices and thought maybe it's too soon to claim anything as a best practice in this space. Maybe they're good, right? And then lessons learned, right? What not to do. 
Um, and then we generate a roadmap, a roadmap of to-dos, right? And, and this is help, hopefully contributing to the development of standards. We might see where their standards needs as we try to build these solutions. And then help in the adoption of the technology as well, right? These are things that need to be done to increase adoption, things that need to, need to be done to, to do standards work. Um, I should mention anyone interested in collaborating, if you go to the, to the link I had, um, that'll kind of give you the rules of the road, um, how you can collaborate or you can send me an email. Um, and I'll get you with those guys. Um, but I think I think for where it's going, um, there's there's steps to get there. There's standards. There's principles. Um, you know, there's a lot of work to do to get there. Right, right. So you, you mentioned digital transformation, which is uh, uh, something that just about every organization is going through um, or needs to go through. And we're talking a lot more about the use of standards in digital transformation later in our in our session today and it's a big focus for us so so how do you think zero trust will help um organizations who are going through that transformation because obviously security is a right uh, as, as we get more digital security becomes a uh, even more important right so i think as, as organizations undergo digital transformation if um you know, a few years ago, the answer for cyber on the cybersecurity side was, well, you have to build a perimeter. You have to define a perimeter and build a perimeter and put up your fences and everyone inside is trusted and everyone outside is not. Um, that wouldn't work, right? That's just a barrier then to get where you want to go. And I think the exciting part of zero trust and in, in implementing um, the access control this way is that it removes that barrier that if you want to use cloud resources wherever, or you want to access um, applications wherever, using whatever device and wherever you are, that access control um, and, and the ability to secure the information and the resources can happen regardless of where you are. You're in a perimeter, you're not in a perimeter, and whatever network you're on. Um, so, you know, a few years ago, we would have been going, ooh, but now we've removed that barrier of, of um, a possible barrier of cybersecurity. Right. Okay, cool. And another thing that everyone's uh, interested in right now is is agility and speed to market and all of the, all of these things. Do you think uh, zero trust can help there? Yeah, I think so. Um, because I think with the fine grained access control, in some ways, your the products and services aren't forced to fit into a particular cybersecurity scheme of this within the perimeter, right? There's a little more yeah. flexibility there, and maybe um, that's something that some of the um, product and services vendors, I'm talking non-cybersecurity, don't then have to worry about how they fit in there, um, right. in that perimeter. So I, I, I think it helps there. Um, I wanted to mention the other thing, and, and maybe um, this is something you often talk about because I'm not sure it's true. Hmm. Um, so in looking at, at zero trust, it really forces you to look at users and assets and resources and applications because you're going to have that fine grain access control. And I'm thinking that that type of information actually is really helpful as you go through a digital transformation process, right? Um, so I think it actually sort of is cyclic and it feeds back into that process as well. Okay, thank you. And um, how about in the, in the, in the federal space? Um, the, how yep. do you see the impact of, um, of zero trust in, in federal? Federal. So, um, yeah. So um, a few years ago in the U.S. federal government, we had a pretty big breach of empl federal employee information. It was it was quite stunning. Right. Um, and I think that was the motivation for the in the U.S., the federal government, the CIO council to get together and say, you know, enough is enough. We have to change something. And so um, they, that's how they um, what triggered the motivation to, to look at zero trust. And I think um, in the federal space, the, while the wheels of enterprise can turn slowly, um, I think there is a recognition that those wheels must turn. And like the private sector, we need to go through these digital transformations, right? In terms of how we work, you know, how we work, we all know how we're going to work now, right? This is, you know, this is, I don't know that we're all going to telework forever or remotely work, but, but you know, this is it. Um, and so federal agencies recognize that. They know they have to change as, as they do in the private sector. So I think these concepts are going to be um, the same. In terms of NIST and our role, um, as I said before, we have to update our guidance to recognize that. And I think we have to maybe even put in more guidance to help them that through that, that zero trust evolution process. Um, and not just on the technical side, but on management and process guidance as well, right? 
how you manage and operationalize zero trust is a little different than that traditional perimeter um, right. security architecture. And so I think for federal agencies, they have to think about that as well. Right. So do you, do you see a, a way of, of getting some kind of compliance around zero trust in the, in the federal space in particular, or even, even broader? Yeah, so um, in terms of zero trust itself, um, you know, I, the, the, you know, I, I don't, I don't know exactly what the requirements are going to look like for federal agencies to implement zero trust per se, right. but they still have to implement their same cybersecurity policies, right, and meet the same requirements regardless of the uh, whether it's zero trust or perimeter. And one of the advantages of using zero trust is that um, it's really good at logging data. It's really right. good at logging activity. And so um, that that data is processable. Um, and so as federal agencies go through their security assessments and their audits, they have that processable data. I think that's great to use. Um, and it also offers a feedback loop in terms of enforcement. So how your security, you have your security policy and how do you know it's being implemented correctly, it's enforced correctly, right? So you have all this data um, you can know is your is your policy implemented even correctly? Um, is there did they did they miss something in the security policy? Right? Are there assets out there kind of running muck? Users doing all kinds of things, right? And and at the end of the day, is at least privilege. Have you implemented a policy that says for a given user they have the access they need and no more? Right. That's really the concept here, the access you need and no more. Um, and I think that helps it. And then finally, I think this data actually gets to um, when there is an incident in, in recovery and response, um, you know, sort of like a hidden gem there that, that you have that really fine grained detailed um, event information that when there is an incident. Right. Lisa, I don't, I don't know where that 25 minutes went exactly, but it, but it, but it went and uh, we, we, we do need to move on. But I, I do have a, um, a, a question from one of our attendees today about, about NIST cooperation. Um, specifically, um, are you working with ISO and IEC for cybersecurity standards? I'm thinking specifically of ISO 27000 and IEC 62443. Not necessarily the, um, the specifics, but right. if, if you could at least answer the general. Yes. So. Um, so this is probably a very uh, standards aware, cybersecurity ISO standards aware person that wrote the question. Um, so we are involved in, in um, we're involved in the IEC work. In the ISO work, um, I don't know that we have direct participation, but we certainly always have a goal that um, the NIST document that is sort of a, um, uh, uh, analogous to the 27,000 series is the risk management framework. 853, right? And so we always seek to make sure that those, they are aligned, that they are not inconsistent, that they are not in conflict, because we recognize that many folks who want to meet the principles of NIST documents, right, the other document, 839, which talks about how to manage cybersecurity risks, they may actually do so in an implementation of that 27,000. Um, and then you, and then you get the benefit if you choose to be, um, certified or registered, certified now, right? They call it certified. If you choose to go down that path, you know, that that's there and there's consistency. That's great. Thank you for, thank you for taking that. And um, with that, we must, uh, we must move on with our day. Thank you for giving us a great start, Lisa, and uh, good luck in your, uh, your, your work in NIST and we look forward to future collaboration. So uh, absolutely. big, big virtual you. round of applause. Thank All you very right. much, Lisa. Thank you.